how did Dua Lipa manage to become a music superstar by ignoring all kinds of conventional wisdom? This is the question we will explore in this video. We will focus on 5 bits of advice everyone hears over and over and over again. Focus on just one thing. Build your fan base on social media and give them what they want. Collaborate early and often to broaden your appeal and the king of them all. Done is better than perfect. We'll see how Lipa ignored all of these rules and why. But hey, am I missing the fifth piece of advice? Yes. It's the one that starts our story and it's probably the most incredible challenge to conventional wisdom one can imagine. Would you let your 15-year-old daughter live in a big city in a foreign country, pretty much unsupervised by any adult? I don't know if I would. Kids need to be with their families or at least with someone who is old and wise enough to keep them out of trouble. Yet one day in 2010, the Lipas gave in to the pleas of their daughter Dua. They allowed her to move to London, England, a place almost 1900 kilometers from their home in Pristina, Kosovo. Were they completely mad? Not really. Hello Top Hatters, this is Simon Mas, your friend with a master degree in music and evidently old fashioned views on parenting. You see, Duke Jean and Anessa Lipa had their reasons to let Dua go. One, the family had lived in the British capital for years before returning to a pacified Kosovo. In fact, Dua was born in the UK and she had lived there until she was 11. Two, Dua's plan of action made a lot of sense. She said she intended to go to British University. Completing her A-levels in a London school would have got her into a more prestigious university than any degree in any school in Pristina. 3. Dua was going to live with the daughter of a family friend who was going to study for a master's degree at the London School of Economics. 4. When Dua discussed their idea with her family, she was incredibly well prepared and single-minded about going. For Duke Jean and Anesa, saying no simply wasn't an option. This already tells us a lot about Dua Lipa even at that young age. With big dreams, an uncommonly strong will and focus, she was ready to do anything to achieve her goals, including lying to her parents. Wait. So, she was lying? Well, no, not technically. Dua indeed enrolled in a London secondary school, the Parliament Hill School, an institute for girls in Camden. But she had no intention of pursuing a university degree in England or elsewhere. Dua wanted to become a singer, and what better place than London to make it big? She got her A-levels. Then, Dua told her family she was going to take a gap year to consider her options about university. In fact, she found a job to support herself. She also enrolled in part-time weekend singing lesson at the Sylvia Young Theatre School. Why part-time? Because those were the classes for students who wanted to pursue their passion, not for those who would get any job in the music industry to make ends meet. It was a different kind of vibe and Dua loved it. Come on, dance with me. Once she finished school, Dua Lipa wasn't just taking singing lessons though. Dua started a YouTube channel. Okay, that's a bit misleading because the content was basically Dua singing. Covers. Christina Aguilera, Joss Stone, Jesse J. The idea was to use whatever rudimentary equipment she had to try to get some attention from scouts, managers, labels. But being a YouTuber is hard as I know very well. That's why you need to give this video a thumb up and drop me a comment telling me what you liked in it. Please! Without your input, I can't get better. Without your interaction, YouTube 
will not show this video to other people who might be interested in it, which, unfortunately, is what happened to Dua Lipa pretty much. She had some views, but mostly from people in Kosovo. In time, this would change, but by then Dua had already taken another route. But singing and her YouTube channel were not her only focus. She also worked, as we said. First, as a nightclub hostess checking people out and sending away those who weren't properly dressed. Then, since she hated that job, she became a waitress for La Bodega Negra, a Mexican restaurant in Soho. Okay, what else? She had a blog, Dua Daily. Just like her old YouTube channel, it's gone now, but from what I gather, it was a life and fashion blog. Did someone say fashion? Why, but that was yet another thing Dua focused on. She did some modeling work. She thought it might have been a good way to raise some money. She thought it might have been a good way to meet people that might give a push to her music career. In fact, it was neither. She didn't do much modeling because she refused to slim down. So the only real thing modeling gave her was a chip on her shoulder about her appearance. After some soul searching, though, Dua shrugged the psychological burden off. She was not going to change her body image to please anyone, and she was not to compromise when it came to work. It was her way or no way. Created something phenomenal. When her gap year was about to expire, Dua Lipa got a contract. Not a record contract, no. It was a management agency contract. Still more than most budding musicians can get. And this was a contract with Ben Mosen of Tap Music, the agency managing Lana Del Rey. Hot stuff. Mozan was conquered by Dua's youth, personality and ambition. He decided the agency would give her a small salary so that she could quit her waiting job and concentrate on music. Time to tap into that YouTube fanbase she had mastered and give them more music like that of her most liked videos. Time to put out an album, flood the market with content like the gurus say. No. In fact, Dua Lipa closed her YouTube channel and her blog for a while. She even kept waiting tables. Dua thought it was best slowing everything down to avoid mistakes. She needed her signature sound, one that would put forward her voice, one that showed to the listener all of her vocal nuances. Without that, everything else was too risky. If Dua had put out a song and people liked it, would she then be stuck with that sound happened by accident? And if people didn't like it, was it because she wasn't good or because she had chosen the wrong kind of genre or vibe for her? In this precarious position, Dua felt she needed to do her homework. Mozan coupled her with producers and authors. She launched into a quest to get to the music that she heard inside her head. A mix between pop and hip hop. She was to be the conjunction between Nelly Furtado and J. Cole, if you wish. Dua Lipa spent the best part of a year writing some 130 songs and throwing almost all of them away in the trash can. And then, one day, Dua finally composed the song that was worth building her debut upon. It was completed when she saw an image on a Tumblr dashboard, a black background with a phrase in red, hotter than hell. That was the perfect idea to complete a semi-autobiographical song about the bitter end of a difficult relationship. The best phrase to complete a powerful chorus that would stick with the listener even after the music was over. And while working on Hotter Than Hell, Lipa and producer Steven Kosmeniuk finally came up with the idea of a darker pop, something that used Dua's lowest tones in a rap-infused verse with a pop-explosive chorus. 
Upon listening to the song in 2015, Warner Music decided to offer Dua Lipa a recording contract. Now the road was all downhill, right? Right? Despite winning her a recording contract hotter than hell, was not the right choice for Dua's first single. At least, that was the opinion of Warner Music executives. The choice for Dua's debut was New Love. It was a song written after a dry spell in the studio. Dua had put herself in a cul-de-sac for some time, trying to write another hotter than hell. When she realized she wasn't forced to stick to a formula, New Love came out almost effortlessly. Dua liked the feedback New Love had received from her friends. The song was hypnotic, soft, different from the hammering rhythm of most other dance pop songs of the era. New Love came out on the 15th of August 2015 as a streaming only single. It received quite the attention from the press, and a lot of journalists noticed that Mozon wasn't the only link Lipa had with Lana Del Rey. New Love was written and produced with Emily Haney and Andrew Wyatt, longtime collaborators of the American singer. Everyone assumed that Del Rey had something to do with Lipa. Perhaps Duas was Lana's protege? Interviewer after interviewer asked her about her relationship with Del Rey, and Dua pointed out time and again that they didn't have anything in common apart from their management agency. But the rumors continued. Perhaps everyone expected a collaboration between the two singers, but it didn't happen. Dua kept producing singles always alone. October 2015 Be the One becomes a success in Australia and Europe. February 2016 Last Dance seems to be playing constantly on the airways around the world. May 2016 Hotter Than Hell is finally released. It hit number 15 in the British charts. All along, Dua received many requests from all kinds of artists for duets and collaborations. Collaborations are instrumental in getting your art in front of a wider and more diverse audience. All of them career experts say that. So why did Dua decide against it? For one thing, Dua wanted to present herself to the audience. Authenticity played a big role in what she was doing. At this stage, a collaboration could be distracting for the public. It could reveal parts of her world she didn't think were too important. Shift the focus away from her. In addition, many of the songs she received as vehicles for possible collaborations weren't really exciting. Such releases might not be a celebration of the qualities that made both acts thrilling, but just a way to make a quick buck playing the celebrity meets celebrity music game. And Dua didn't like that at all. She was in to build a solid career, not to fool her hard-earned fans and then blow it. But even that was probably not the main reason behind Dua rejecting collaborations at this stage. We'll cover that in 60 seconds, but first, let me tell you another fact. About 95% of the people watching my videos are not subscribed to my channel, which sucks because with another 500-ish people, I can get monetized and you, all of you, can get better videos. Why better? Because I will use whatever little money YouTube throws my way to get more books to research, more time to shoot, and who knows, perhaps even a collaborator who can actually edit a video properly. More variety of topics, more depth, more quality. For free! And all it takes is one second to push that subscribe button and another to add your like to this video. If you're still watching this, I think it kind of deserves your love, right? Make YouTube a better place for yourself. Do it now. Thank you. Did I beat the clock? I got no, I count hey. The one reason keeping Dua from accepting collaborations, however, was her character. 
Not only was she a perfectionist, but she had a strong need for control. She was obsessed with controlling every aspect of her releases because she was obsessed with presenting her real self to the public. Naturally, collaborations require relinquishing some control, by definition. Dua's obsession with authenticity led to another unconventional decision. After the success of Hotter Than Hell, most artists would have capitalized on their rising popularity. It was time to release an album. Dua Lipa instead decided to go on tour. She didn't feel she had enough material to release the album she wanted to. She also felt that singing live in front of an audience would be the best way to connect with them, to communicate what she was all about. As she played across UK and Europe, the audience reaction became more and more enthusiastic. Dua ended up opening for Troy Sivian on several of his US dates. American audiences don't always embrace new European acts, but she found a way to their hearts too. Once back in London, Dua Lipa announced her debut album for February 2017. Then, in January 2017, she posted on Facebook. The album was delayed once again. New songs and finally some collaborations had to be included in the tracklist, but Dua didn't make any excuses. She explicitly blamed her perfectionism for the delay. She wanted everything to be as perfect as it could possibly be. It almost felt this was the only shot she could get at releasing an album. On the 15th of April, Dua started a new tour to support the release of her first album and her newest single, New Rules. When her first album came out, it was a real event. It was called Dua Lipa, like her. Many new acts named their first album after them, but this was different. The music really reflected Dua's experience and growth as an artist. This was no marketing ploy. This was a labor-intense attempt to share Dua's intimate life with her audience, and she managed to do it without much rhetoric or artifices. So much so that the music press praised their lyrics as highly emotional and true. It was an enormous success. The album went to the top of the charts around the world, and when Dua played Glastonbury on the 23rd of June, her performance was celebrated as one of the highest points of the festival, a festival which included Ed Sheeran, Foo Fighters and Radiohead, among others. In December, Spotify certified she was the most streamed female artist of the year, and in 2018, Dua Lipa received two Brit Awards, British Female Solo Artist and Breakthrough Artist. Evidently, her debut was worth the wait. Well, my dear Top Potters, this is the end of this story. But there will be more stories coming, and more about Dua Lipa. Promised. This was Simon Mas and you. You stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye! Simon Mas, music you love.